Here's an idea. In foregoing spectacle, Nintendo games have a kind of cohesion. This episode is supported by our patrons and Skillshare. Like what, you are perhaps asking in response to the question posed in the title of this video, and it's a little hard to answer directly without sounding judgmental, so maybe it's easier to say what Nintendo games don't look like. By and large, the games released for Nintendo systems, not just games made by Nintendo, but the games which are playable on Nintendo hardware, don't look like the cinematic polygon fests which have come to define competing hardware. A PlayStation, an Xbox, a PC. This isn't to say that Nintendo games don't look good, quite the opposite, in fact. Just that there's a difference in the visual character, let's call it, of pillar games like Animal Crossing, Splatoon, or Fire Emblem, and say, Dark Souls, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Persona 5. <laughs> And yeah, of course Nintendo games look different. Their hardware just simply isn't the number crunching, texture rendering, polygon spewing Goliath found in other corners of the gaming world on purpose. One big factor that determines why Nintendo games look the way they do is the economics of system design. Unlike Sony or Microsoft, Nintendo has a policy of not selling consoles at a loss. And to profit, their systems must be relatively cheap to produce, which means they're not using the most cutting, bleeding, passing out edge of rendering technology that comes with a high price tag. Cheaper also often means more family friendly, which is likewise part of the Nintendo brand and a factor that guides both their tech and content strategy. So. We've actually answered our question pretty quickly. Why do Nintendo games look like that? Because brand reputation and hardware. And why the hardware? Because Mike makes that weird rubbing hand motion that means money. So a more interesting question might be, what results from the fact Nintendo games tend to look the way they do? What happens to the games themselves and the people who play them because those games share a kind of broad visual character? Because Nintendo games tend to look like Nintendo games while PC, Xbox, and PlayStation games tend to look like one another. Also, in before PC Master Race. You know what I mean. To answer that question, we're gonna talk about something that more than a few people mentioned when I asked about this on Twitter. That Nintendo is primarily interested in content. Long-running series which tell compelling, impactful stories with great gameplay mechanics on surprising technology as opposed to spectacle, making the latest and greatest rip-roaring rendering powerhouses. Calling something a spectacle is a way of calling it sort of empty. All glitz, no guts. All show, no go. All looks, no inside stuff. Often spectacle is primarily visual, something which is striking or exciting but lacks significance beyond its excitement. Calling something pure spectacle is a way of saying that it's incredible to behold, but ultimately lacks a kind of depth. Situationist international philosopher Guy Debord went so far as to say that modern life is only spectacle. Society transitioned, he said, from placing value on being to having, and now has transitioned from having to simply appearing which is to say, the seeming nature of things is sort of more important than what's actually the case. All human life, which is to say, all social life is mere appearance, he wrote in The Society of the Spectacle, claiming that the proliferation of media images and mass-produced goods, among other things, distance us from our own experiences, often in the interest of capitalist forces. I think it's hasty to excuse Nintendo completely from both the general dictionary and specific crabby philosopher senses of spectacle. They're just as guilty of trafficking in awesome-looking stuff with no real deep thematic purpose as the next console manufacturer, and they're also a consumer electronics company. But I can appreciate that they clearly don't pursue insane graphics, one kind of visual spectacle, at the literal cost of other pillars, like responsible stewardship of beloved long-running game franchises, novel technology, epic stories, family-oriented gameplay, and also a kind of long-running cohesion. Where games on other hardware feel like, you know, games. Those on Nintendo hardware often feel meaningfully and cohesively like Nintendo games. The hardware limitations relative to their moment corral them into a visual group that's distinct from most else that's out there at the time. Which isn't to say that other groups of games don't cohere into visual groups, but that it's uncommon to find a set of games which cohere as well over as long a period of time or under such a clearly identifiable umbrella as Nintendo games. And that as an umbrella, Nintendo has some particular things going for it. In a way, spectacle is kind of the opposite of cohesion. It must always move significantly and confidently away from what exists in order to be striking. Part and parcel with spectacle is newness and novelty, the unexpected. By comparison, Nintendo games, even upon release, are always already a little 
older looking, occupying a generation of rendering technology somewhere in the past. This, though, paradoxically helps them age better, I think, and is part of how that visual group which forms under the Nintendo umbrella feels so cohesive. Because in its pursuit of extreme newness, spectacle often ages really strangely. Spectacular visual effects are often the ones that look oldest the soonest. Especially in movies and video games, spectacle is associated with fidelity, the as faithful as possible rendering of the appearance of real life reality in pixels. It's not that Half-Life or Fallout 3 don't look realistic, it's just that the rapid march of spectacularity allows us, via comparison to Doom 2016 or Fallout 4 HD, to see how much more realism there was and still is to be had, except for like the demons and stuff. And surely those games will suffer the same fate down the road until the point at which the technology they use to animate Tarkin and Rogue One is widely available, and we don't even really need actors anymore. Failure will find you explaining why to a far less patient audience. The upshot being, games in general, and even games within the same series, can end up looking remarkably less like one another because of how rapidly earlier entries age. Nintendo games, though, ameliorate the effects of this rapidly aging pixel problem. Weirdly, by looking older from the get-go, many titles age slower. The visual character of many Nintendo games sidesteps the aging issue by opting for a stylized reality befitting their hardware, and in doing so, allows these games to age more gracefully. As a result, more games end up looking more like one another. What I'm not saying is that Pokemon Red looks the same as Pokemon Moon, that the former doesn't look older and that the latter doesn't look newer, but rather that 20 years apart, they both look more like one another than, say, Tomb Raider or Doom look like themselves 20 years apart and that both Red and Moon look more like the Nintendo catalog as a whole across that 20 years than any one entry in the Tomb Raider or Doom series appears representative of some grand PC or console aesthetic. So while economics might be the reason, their visual affect might be the raison d'etre for why Nintendo games look the way they do. Playing a Nintendo game, there's a strong visual connection to the history of Nintendo games. Playing a Nintendo game now feels much like playing one 25 years ago. Holy moly, I've been playing Nintendo games for 25 years. Not just because many a game's visual style is cartoony or friendly and I was a child 25 years ago, or because a series from my childhood is still ongoing, but because new games have managed to grow up without distancing themselves so exceptionally from their predecessors. While there may be economic reasons Nintendo games look the way they do, what happens to those games and the people who play them as a result is a kind of cohesion, both between the games themselves and our experiences across playing them, potentially, for many years. In emphasizing a set of things beyond spectacle, what's created is a link to the past, you might say. What do y'all think? What defines the Nintendo aesthetic and what results from it? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding whitewashing and Asian erasure after our conversation with Kevin Nguyen. That will be out tomorrow, and when it is, we will put a link in the doobly-doo and on the end card. Also, let us know how you're feeling about this whole comment responses on Friday thing. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. There is no Tweet of the Week this week, but just to fill this time, if you have an Instagram account, you should follow, well, you should follow me, but you should also follow Twin Peaks Bunnies, because, I mean, come on. Look at this bunny. It's just, it's a joy every time it pops up in my feed. I can't believe this is real. And hey, in case you were wondering, this week's episode was sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with classes in design, business, and more. Premium membership includes unlimited access to thousands of classes like Cocktail Secrets, making your signature drink with, hey, would you look at that Ivy Mix, and is available starting at $10 a month. Download the Android or iPhone app to learn anywhere. Get a two-month free trial by clicking on the link below or going to Skillshare.com. Use the promo code IDEACHANNEL at checkout. If you would like to support the show, Idea Channel has a Patreon. Thank you so, so much to all of our current patrons, you mean the world to us. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these number-crunching, texture-rendering, polygon-spewing goliaths.